mind to it. And so when I, I stumbled upon it, this is many, many years ago, but it was after seminary. I didn't, we didn't have a course on Isaiah in seminary. So it was only, and, and it was only after that, it, that, that I read, and, oh my gosh, I, I, I never knew that. And I, I got a sidebar, I, and I guess I was waiting for somebody to mention something, and no one has. But a lot of music that we use in church comes from these texts. These, I mean, post Vatican II, new music, a lot of it is from Deutero Isaiah. Now, which led a, which led a commentator, a, church, a churchman, to say, doesn't that say something about America? That we identify ourselves with a people who are in exile. I mean, we're not. We're on top of the world. We're wealthy. We're independent. But we want to say, oh, poor little me. Oh, on eagle's wings, you're wrapped around me. He was making a comment about, I mean, not a, not a complimentary comment, about how we think of ourselves as, as you know, God's poor little people. And the world does not look at America as God's poor little people. It's just, it was just ironic, a kind of a comment. But, but, now, but aren't we all longing for heaven? I mean, isn't that our exile right now? That's not what I think most people think of when they sing these songs. I don't. You, I mean, you can argue that. That's nice. Nice recovery. Uh, but, but his point was just that there are, you know, we don't like to sing songs of you know, we don't sing songs of judgment. We don't sing. We don't sing lament. We don't sing songs about. You know, we don't see ourselves as vic We see ourselves as victims, not as sinners. That's 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 the difference. I guess I didn't say it quite so well. We see other people are doing this to us, versus we have done this to ourselves. That was that was that was me a better way of saying the, making the point. Correct. There, you, that's a good point. Well, uh, my, that's my theme this Sunday is, you're bad people! <laughs> my, my question is, is something happened after they came back uh, as an exile? Yes. Because they don't talk, there's no prophet like Isaiah. Correct. You know, interesting point. Isaiah, when they come back next, when the next time, the exile was tough. I mean, you know, in one sense, you could say Isaiah filled them full of gas, you know, and told them, you know, how wonderful things are going to be. And, the, and then they came back and they found it was really, really hard. And so, again, Isaiah had its place and a whole Bible of Isaiah would be like, Ugh. but but you're going to see the, the return to the promised land was not a walk in the park by any means. And, and so they continue to struggle. And, but there, you're right, there is nothing like Second Isaiah. So then, so then, something happened. Something happened. I, you have to tell us, because I do not know, that Christians, all the Christians, start to quote him all from Isaiah. Yes. So, so, so something is going on here. What's going on is, I think... I think, the, well, and we'll, we'll, by the next, by the end of the next lecture, we'll look at the phenomenon of the servant of Yahweh poems. Right. They had had a huge impact on how Christians read Isaiah. Isaiah is sometimes called the fifth gospel, mm -hmm. the fifth gospel, because because it has been seen so much as an expression of who Jesus is, yeah. was coming, and has been. I think maybe that's where, you're right, Isaiah is probably, the other than Psalms, is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. But when they did it, then they really identified with Jesus, right? Jesus, yeah, through Jesus. It's through Jesus that they identify with Isaiah. Okay. 
Okay? All right. Well, if you're not going to have anything else to say, why are they doing that bell? <laughs> Usually that means it's time for a group to gather. For, for there's, no other, there's, no other, there's no other cars in the lot. Maybe. A storm is coming. Maybe, the, maybe, the, maybe, yeah, maybe Ukraine and Russia have launched missiles. And, well, I warned them. I rang the bell. <laughs> Is that what that means? How about come to the chapel and eat? Well, it could mean that too. Maybe that's why it's doing it so many times. Maybe. They can come and tell us then. Because they didn't tell me we eat at 11. So. It's prohibited to bring food to the chapel. Jesus is my food, and I meet him in the chapel. Okay, can we just stop this and go on? All right. Say, okay, one, two, three, good morning, Connie. One, two, three, good morning, Connie. Some people know how to party. Come late. <laughs> you know, never come late. You know, always pick up. All right. So, Second Isaiah chapters 49 to 55. There is a major change here. Cyrus is never mentioned again nor the emphasis on Yahweh's complete control. You know, I am Yahweh, there is no other. I am the first and the last. That theme is gone. Nor is there a critique of the foolishness of idols, which again, which we had in the first section. The focus, which was on the whole people, on Israel, Jacob, now becomes more focused on Zion, on Jerusalem. Zion, by the way, is, is a nickname. It's one of the hills of Jerusalem, and so it becomes a nickname for the city. Hmm? Israel is now described as a group of God's disciples who suffer, who are rejected. The bubbling confidence of the first nine chapters moderates to a more contemplative, somber attitude because it suggests that, or it suggests to readers that the people are finding the, the way more difficult. There's a more inward focus, less an outer political element, more concerned with the internal situation of the peoples. So it's, it's not a, 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 a wholly different work, but it's a different tone in the world. A little more like, you know, like the, you know, they, they ate, you know, first, the first chapters 40 to 49 or 48 are like they had two cups of coffee, okay? And now it's like the caffeine is worn down and they're just a little more feet on the ground, okay? So 49, chapter 49. This is this, it, it's, a, it's a sense, a new commissioning, but it's also the second servant poem. Where was the first servant poem? 42. Okay, here's the second servant poem. There are three of them in this section, huh? So this is the second one. Listen to me, O coastlands. Hearken, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right hand is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord. He says, is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob? to restore the preserved of Israel, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation 
may reach to the end of the earth. So you can hear this at different levels. It is, in a sense, a second call. If you understand the I as the serf, as the, as the prophet. Hmm? It, um, and then, but again, Israel, it says servant and Israel, those, those are next to each other. So the prophet still sees, you know, may, could, could see the servant as the personification, like Uncle Sam is the personification of America. So is the servant personification of the, the exile community. The, the community has, or the individual here, has been prepared by God from his womb. His mother's womb, not his womb, his mother's womb. And, and he has tried and, not, and felt not successful. See that? He's been unsuccessful. But God, but God says not to worry, not to worry. In fact, I'm going to give you bigger responsibilities to the, all the nations you are to speak, not just, not just to my little people, Israel. This reading is used on the feast of the birth of John the Baptist. You probably can see why, huh? Uh, no, not his birth, probably his beheading. I think it's read, it's read out for his beheading. The idea that he was unsuccessful and yet did God's bidding. It's, of course, used of Christ. We read the servant poems during Holy Week. It, they're the first reading on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Holy Week, and then on Good Friday. Okay? So as Christians, we read them through a Christian set of lenses. But again, I also want you to think of them because they were written, they were spoken to the Jewish people in a particular moment. How does that fit into that? Moment. Again, we don't have the answers, but just I just want you to be aware of that too. Um, I don't want you to be those Christians who say, I don't see why the Jews didn't get Jesus. It's all over the Bible. Well, it is. It is, but it's 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 in a hindsight view, not in a predictive view that people could have could have been accused of being silly for not having seen it. Because there are other ways of reading the text. Okay? Verse 8, again, a theme that we saw earlier in the announcement of a new exodus. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have not answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritage, saying to the prisoners, come forth, to those who are in darkness, appear, they shall feed along the ways, and all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor, nor sun shall smite them. Verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. So again, we get this pushback. This has not been easy. Huh? The Lord has forsaken me. And the Lord responds, God responds, can a woman forget her sucking child? that she should have no compassion on the child of her womb. Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have carved your names on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders outstrip your destroyers, and those who laid you waste go forth from you. So. The, the, the tenor continues to be encouraging, but you, we, we read between the lines the complaints of the people that suggest it's not been a walk in the park. Verse 19 of the same chapter. Surely your waste and desolation, desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants, and those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children born in the time of your bereavement will yet, will yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make a room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have then these come? So the prophet is talking to the city, as I see it. And, and you know, again, cities were seen as feminine. Um, they, again, in, in, in ancient life, 
Um, the domestic space, the inside of the house, was women's space. And a city has a domestic space. It has a wall that protects the village or the city like the walls of a house. And so um, God speaks to the virgin daughter, the city, uh, Jerusalem. And she says, who are all of these? I mean, so what the prophet is promising is that exiles from will, will come. And, and Jews who were born in exile are returning. They've never seen the city. The city has never seen them. And the walls, the old walls, are not going to be big enough. You're going to have to stretch the, the, your tent cloths and make them bigger because God is going to call his people back in great numbers. Okay, Verse 22. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you. So other nations and the rulers of other nations will bow down to you because you are mine. And you're gonna, you, you right now are powerless, but you're going to come back into power. Okay? Chapter 50, verse 4, is the third your servant of Yahweh Paul. By the way, some people talk about the suffering servant. Okay, you've heard that phrase. Actually, suffering does not appear in the first poem at all. It appears hugely in the fourth poem. And there's a couple references to it in the second and third. So I don't call them, and I don't advise you to call them the suffering servant of Yahweh poems. They're the servant of Yahweh poems. Okay. Though again, some of them, as we go deeper, are going to show more, and you'll see why, Christ, why these leapt out to Christians already in the first generation. They read this and said, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is Christ. This is Christ. Let's read this. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him that is weary. Morning by morning he wakens, he wakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. Again, if you're a fan of, of Handel's Messiah, these verses are used in the middle part, which are, which are portraying the suffering of Christ. Huh? So I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. So what you have here is, again, a servant of God who is mocked and shamed and suffers, but who says, I'm strong, I'm like flint, because God will vindicate me. Now, doesn't that fit in with the Christian story? Christ who suffers terribly, and yet God vindicates, the Father vindicates him. Easter is that vindication. So you, you see right away how this, this story fit the Christian story. Right? Why, I thought the Jewish looking at things differently than Christians, so vindication to me is like an earthly Sure, and I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not saying that Jews, when they read this, they thought of the Messiah who would die and rise from the dead. They had, there was no expectation of that. Right. But when after Easter, Christians read this, and it's like, oh my gosh, it reads to a Christian post-Easter, this is the Christ story. Vindication equals resurrection here. Huh? They, they add another layer of meaning. Okay. 51. Hearken to me, you who pursue deliverance, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were digged. Look to the Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. 
For when he was but one, I called him and I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden. So the prophet is saying God made a pledge to Abraham and that pledge will be fulfilled with us. God keeps his words to us. Look at verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who did cut Rahab in pieces that did pierce the dragon? Was it not you who did dry up the sea, the waters of the great deep? that didst make the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Okay, another name you need to learn. Rahab. Now you know Rahab, don't you? Who is Rahab? The one that you know. Joshua, store book of Joshua. But not, not, that's, not to, that's today. That's not the Rahab you know. Oh. The Rahab you already know before this book. No. no. Not, not, that's not pure. She's saved um, the, 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 spies. the spies. The spies in Jericho. That was a Rahab too. I just want to, I just want, but you guys are right. Who is this Rahab? Well, I hope you used your Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible. If you didn't, do when you get home, look it up. There is, remember when we read the, the creation stories? We read the ones from Babylon, Enuma Elish, and then Atrahasis, the flood story. We read a little bit of the, the greater Babylonian stories. And then we read the G Genesis story. And there's a little bit, and again, the Genesis story is a huge separation from the, the Enuma Elish was, remember the gods had a fight, you know, and the younger gods wanted to murder the, 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 the senior gods, and then there was this body of this god to get rid of. Okay, so Babylonian cosmology begins with a war, okay? Where in Genesis, God is completely in charge, huh? God says, let there be. Now there's some remnants. The, the, the Babylonian story begins with waters, remember? The, the salt waters and the sea waters meet. I mean, the fresh waters and the sea waters meet. And so does Genesis begin with the water covers the face of the earth. So there are memories, there are ancestral memories when God says, let us, you know, let, there, let us do this, let us do that, well, that too could be ancestral memory to the Babylonian stories where there's a bunch of gods who are doing creation, not just the one God. But here's another example. Rahab is a reference to a dragon or a personification of, 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 of the, an evil force. And again, the story of Enuma Elish Okay, that's the, yeah, that's the Babylonian story. Who was the hero? It was Marduk. Talk about Marduk being the, the god of the Babylonians. Huh? And, the, and his mother, the mother goddess was Tiamat. Remember that name? So Rahab is another version of Tiamat. This, this feminine, wicked, chaotic force that had to be controlled. So God's defeat of Rahab is, is telling the creation story, blending a little bit of, the, of other stories to say God is creator. God defeats the force of chaos, be it Tiamat, be it the waters, be it Rahab. They're all the same. A couple of the Psalms reference the same, will mention Rahab. So it's just an old ancestral story that is part of the Middle Eastern creation myths. And the poet here, has God used it? Was it not I who defeated Rahab? Was it not I who destroyed chaos and has led you to freedom? Okay? So while you know the Bible is different, it, it, it's not, it's not, it was born in the Middle East, and it shows the world in which it was born into, little inklings of the other stories that other peoples used. Okay? 52, verse 7. 
which is red on Christmas morning? Just say it. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings glad tidings, who publishes peace, who brings good tidings of good, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Hark, your watchmen lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Now, I want you, I want you to begin to hear it at many levels. We want to hear this on the level of the original nameless prophet. He's again addressing the, the, the exiles. That again, God is their redeemer. That God has defeated the enemy. That he, the prophet, is bringing glad tidings. That God has... has finally bear his holy arm and defeated Babylon. But now, as a Christian, on Christmas morning, when you hear it, what lines stand out as a, as a connection to the Christian story? Oh my, oh my, I'm trembling here, I'm afraid. Oh, they shout for joy. Shout for joy, better than that. Good news. This is, this is where the word gospel comes from. Now again, this is in Hebrew, but good news. And what's the, what's the refrain to every Christmas song? Noel, Noel, Noel. Which is French is good news. So the birth of Christ as good news. And, the, and, and it's announced, huh? The Lord has bared his holy arm, has redeemed Jerusalem, and all the ends of the earth. That's the, that's the psalm for Christmas. All the ends of the earth have seen the power of God. That's Psalm 98. So, as Christians, we, I want you to see the many levels of this. I don't want you to be a kind of a chauvinistic Christian who doesn't believe that the Jews you know, ever wrote this stuff for themselves. But I don't want you to just read it only as a Jew. It has many levels. So the use of it at Christmas is a spiritual re reading. It's, it was initially written in this era, but it gets used again spiritually as the ongoing saving work of God in Christ. Sorry if I beat that to death with you, but um, now you got it. All right. Verse 13. So 52.13 to 53.6. No, 9. 12. There it is. Is the fourth servant poem. This is the one that is read on Good Friday. It's a very long reading. Okay? And this is the one, again, it, it is, as a Christian, it speaks to us of the story of the Passion. Okay? But again, the original second Isaiah didn't likely have a clue of Christ. He was speaking about something in his own experience. The question is, what? Is he speaking about himself? Did he get slapped around? Is he speaking about the, the, the people of God, Israel? Can early remember, back in the early chapters, the servant is Israel. That's pretty clear. But here, it's an individual. It, it seems like an individual, so it can't be. Um, so, now, and Jewish people are, if you have Jewish friends or connections, you know, they've, this text, they read all of these as references to the, the nation. That the servant is the nation. Um, and that's because we Christians have made so much of it being an individual. And so they, they say, this is our song, not yours. Okay? It's all, it's, it's us. Just you'll, you'll hear that. Which I don't think is fair to the text either. It's, it's, a strange, it's a strange question. Is it an individual? Is it a group? Is it both? 
It's hard to make it fit in either category. So here goes. Behold, my servant shall prosper. So first, who's speaking? Who's talking? God. So God is talking. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Now, this is the end. This is the end of the story, okay? Because there's going to be a lot of misery in the middle. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the sons of men, so shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they shall understand. Okay, now go to the end, verse, I mean, it is verse 10 of the next chapter. Because here, it's God speaking again. Okay, so I, I skipped over a bunch because I want to get the divine speeches first, and then we'll read the middle. So, yet it was the will of the Lord, that's not, this is not God speaking, this is third person, huh? or, you know, is the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when he makes himself an offering for sin. An offering for sin. He makes himself an offering for sin. That's strange language. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant. So now notice, it's switched from third person to first. first person. God is speaking now. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great he shall divide the spoil with the strong. So there's a promise of victory because he poured out his soul to death, to the point of death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay, so that's the divine speech part. So we're talking about victory after some kind of travail. This character has made, that he's talking about, that God is talking about, has made a sacrifice somehow of himself. And he will be rewarded for that. Okay, got that part of the narrative, huh? Now let's go back. 53. Okay, 53. Who has believed what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. So now, who's talking? It's, it's passers-by, or it's, it's us talking about God and the servant. See, you gotta, It's like a poem here, or a play, where different speakers take the microphone. First it was God, now it's the people who have seen this man in operation. So he grew up like a young plant, blah, 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 blah. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Go to verse 7. Still, in verse, uh, still it's a third person description of this character. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? He was stricken for the transgressions of my people. Now it's God speaking again. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, 
and there was no deceit in his mouth. With the rich man, his death. You know the story of Jesus' death. He was buried. Joseph of Arimathea had a tomb already open. He's a man of means. And so Jesus is buried in the tomb of a, grave, of a man who was rich. Okay? So, so, that, that, so those are two. Now, the, the center, the, 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 the icing in the cookie is the part that's left. Verse 4. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the poem is laid out in, in, a, in a not super clear fashion, but we've talked about chiasm before. Huh? The letter chi, A, B, B, A. So A, B, B, A, ABBA, the dance group, is a chiasm. Huh? <laughs> So the poem here is a chiasm too. The Lord speaks. The Lord speaks. And then the outsiders speak. And the outsiders speak. And in the center, the portion we just read, that's the icing. That's the cream. That's the central core passage. Okay? So it's a very lengthy poem. It's not, again, the, the pers you know, first person, second person, third person sometimes kind of wavers, but it's written as a unit. And this passage is the center of it. The interesting thing about these Servant of Yahweh poems, you could take four of them and remove them, cut them out of the Bible, and you wouldn't miss them. The text just flows along. In fact, in some ways, it's better. So these four poems, it seems, have been put into the text. You know, they were put into the text. The, the text was cut, and they were put in. Because they, the, 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 the text does not refer them, does not mention them again, nor introduces them. So they're a separate collection of four. And, 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 and we've just read the last one. So take a breath here. What, any comment, question? Quite a few differences in the translation. Again. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it's poetry. Yeah. It's poetry, and poetry is going to be very hard to translate. And, and I suspect I suspect what I've given you is cleaned up for Christian ears. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I bet you if you've got a newer translation, it might not seem quite so clearly Jesus-y. But again, Christians have used this text. I mean, it's, it's in, I mean, look, it's Matthew, I think. But let me just, so I don't embarrass myself here. Um, I'm, there's, there's, it's, I can't find. I'll have to look it up. I'll, I'll give it to you later. But eight seventeen is what my. That's not what I'm talking about. No. Okay, chapter twelve of Matthew. This was to fulfill. This, this is the Gospel of Matthew. This was to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. That's the first servant poem. So already at the level of the of the Gospels. These are associated with Jesus. What you're mentioning is the Acts of the Apostles. Remember the scene? I think I started our course with it. Um, it's, it's the Ethiopian on his way in his cart out of Jerusalem, going back to Ethiopia, and he's reading the passage Isaiah, and Philip is told to walk up alongside him. He says, what are you reading? Or do you understand what, do you understand what you're reading? That's why I read it, because it's like, how can you understand Bible without some help, huh? Because the man says, how can I know? Is the prophet speaking of himself or another? And the passage was just the one that you just, you know, you just cited. Okay. So from the very beginning, this is, Christians are reading this as speaking about Jesus. Though nobody, having read it 10 years before, 
would have said, oh yeah, Messiah's gonna come, he's gonna suffer on a cross, I mean, raising the dead. Nobody would have, that's just a, that's an undreamt dream. But immediately, at, and Jesus, an Emmaus story, he opens up the scriptures, all the passages that in the Old Testament about himself, and then their eyes were opened. See, they didn't see it coming into it, but after it, there's the scales drop from their eyes. Okay? We'll move on. 54. There's two more chapters. We'll get done before lunch, before the bell rings for us. <laughs> you know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Yes, we'll see. Maybe not. Maybe our food's gone bad. In 54, God returns as the husband of Zion. I told you earlier, the city is personified as a woman, okay? And now Yahweh comes as spouse. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in travail. For the children of the desolate one, the city, will be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched. Hold not back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. And again, this is the whole idea of the return, the returned exiles coming back. The city's not big enough. Verse 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. Verse 6. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit. Think back Hosea. Okay, the unfaithful wife whom the prophet then welcomed back. Well, similarly, like a wife of youth which when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you. Well, it was 50 years, but... For God, that's a brief moment. For a brief moment, I've, you've heard that joke about, uh, I, I, I don't know how it starts, but something about a guy talks to God and says, um, God, for you, like, like, like a penny is like nothing, right? Yeah, a million dollars is, is like, just like a penny, yeah? And, and like, like a moment is, is, is like a thousand years, yeah, yeah. Well, God, can you can lend, lend me a million dollars? God says, yeah, in a moment. <laughs> There's more to it than that, but that's okay. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you in overflowing wrath for a moment. Not yet, in hindsight, we can all look back. The bad times, from the good times' sake, the bad times like they dissipate. Again, those of you who have children, who, who give, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've seen one birth live. Okay. And it was it was our third child, so it was like whoosh, kind of like came out of my mouth. <laughs> But I mean I've seen on TV at least, I've seen movies about labor. But Jesus himself says how a woman, after she gives birth, the, the pain just disappears because a life has been brought into the world. Okay. So in hindsight, the, the images of labor here, you know, he I, I may laugh about fifty years of exile, but from the from the side of coming to the new thing, the old thing is it dissipates, and it's, it's, it's let go of. Um, verse 10. For the mountains may depart, and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. Steadfast love, what word? Chesed. Chesed, very good. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on it's a lovely passage. God wedding his people come back from exile. By the way, these are the words for, though the mountains may fall and the hills turn to dust. Now you know, it's much richer than you knew. <laughs> Chapter 55. Okay, stop singing now. I'm sorry I did that. I regret I did that. Chapter 55 is the end of this section, huh, of this lesson. And in a way, it, it, because there's going to be a third Isaiah, and that you're going to find next month, chapters 56 to the end. I think your, one of your homework assignments had you ask the question, 
because this reading is one of the readings, one of the choices for the Easter Vigil. Okay, so we're going to read it now. It's, it's a grand symphonic kind of conclusion to the Deutero Isaiah's message. Ho. Now, that's why my RSV says ho, H-O. That means yo, not like ho as in <laughs> the garden. I know. <laughs> like the garden. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me and eat what is good. Lost my place. Uh, that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. This is the first time that I think David has appeared. Because remember, the monarchy was cut off. Huh? They function without a king. Now they do have Jehoiakim, kin still alive, okay? But they have been functioning uh, without him. Uh, go to verse six. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You know, what you'll find here is, if, you, if you're looking for it, you'll find a lot of references back to earlier passages. So the thing about why do you eat, why do you eat which does not satisfy, remember back in chapter 40, we didn't actually read it, like a shepherd he feeds his flock, he gathers the ewes, he, the, you know, the, the, the desert opens and springs of water. Here, this uh, reference to um, the unrighteous man, his thoughts, remember? Comfort, give comfort to my people. You know, they've done enough time for their, for their sinfulness. Let him return to the Lord that he may have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. You could never have imagined what I had intended for you, God says to them through the prophet. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Remember early in chapter 40, who has held the waters of the earth in the palm of his hand, or the sky is a span? I mean, so this reference again of, of God's transcendence. Verse 10, for as, I mean, this is the announcement of salvation. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return without watering the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. Back in chapter 40, remember? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Okay. Um, verse 12. But you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. Back in chapter 40, it was make smooth the jagged places, fill in the valleys. Well, now the mountains and the hills sing. Okay, they find a voice. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Lovely images, huh? Instead of the thorn, there shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. It shall be to the Lord for a memorial and an everlasting sign which shall not be cut off. Comments? Questions? I have a comment. Uh, uh, referring to the servant songs and how they can be interpreted in different ways, and reused, so to speak. I'm reminded of uh, programmers, just sort of an aside here, but if you're an efficient or a genius programmer like Steve Wozniak, for example, he wrote code that had a purpose, but then he had he arranged it in such a way that you could 
several sheet back to it and use little snippets of it for, for a variety things. of different purposes mm -hmm. and yet made it very compact. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I was struck by how the same song, servant song, could be used in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. I think it's genius. It's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's God looking ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would it also make sense? I don't know if this um, Isaiah, particularly, seems like it's a departure from some Judaism. What I think of what it was is that possible. It's departure. Well, I would say Ju Ju Judaism has to be rebuilt because you yeah. remember yeah. the story has been sacrifice has been a part of the story. Priests, remember, think about the Torah. Think about Leviticus and Numbers. You know what? You know, the land, the temple, the, the priesthood, the, the, law, the laws of diet, all of that. What's going what's gonna to happen now? Do they go back to that? And in fact, they will. They will go back to that. If they have to, but they have to reestablish. Remember, Ezekiel had his vision of a new temple? Yes. So, you know, and it's, but, so Ezekiel was a priest. And so he, see that, he can't see a future without a temple. Uh, because that's that fundamental communication between God and his people. So I wouldn't yet, as, again, as Christians, we can look back and say, wow, this is talking about a new thing. And, but I'd say Jeremiah was talking about a new thing as well. And, and, and so we, again, we, we see it a little differently, but, but the Jews would say, no, it was, it was the continuity was returned. We, we, it was ruptured. We were afraid it to be ruptured, but we returned. And so we picked up the thread. And that's going to be the emphasis for next time. You're going to read Chronicles, and you're going to read Ezra and Nehemiah, and you're going to see the struggle, because Judaism could have become something different. It did after the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans. You know, there are a few Jews who want to rebuild the Temple, but most Jews are saying, no, we're done with that now. It, it led to a new kind of Judaism. But this is not going to be, this is going to be a retying of the threads, re, re and, and continuing the story. Okay? Quest, other questions or comments? I've got about three minutes of text, and then we'll pray for lunch. So, a little history here. The year after Babylon's fall, 538, Cyrus published his edict allowing the Jews to return home. Again, I read, I read a version of it. You're going to see another version of it in the book of Ezra. He ordered the temple to be rebuilt. The book of Ezra will say that Cyrus said this. With help from the Persian treasury. And that the king would return the vessels of the temple that the Babylonians had stolen. The first wave back was led by one of the offspring of Jehoiakim, or Jeconiah, who must have been like 80 years old at this point. His name is Shashbazar, or Sheshbazar. Um, figures for this wave in the book of Chronicles, or no, sorry, from the book of Ezra, the chronicler says it was like 50,000 people came back in the first wave. Maybe that's a little bit exuberant. We don't know. Progress on the temple was slow. And between conflicts with the people who were left behind, because remember, there were Jews left behind. The regular people weren't educated. They were, couldn't read. They were left behind. And they didn't all get along with the exiles. The returned exiles came back, it seems, with a chip on their shoulder. Remember, I, Jeremiah said, you are the future. These people are not. And they kind of, they really, they drank the Kool-Aid there. <laughs> and that led to tension, which got in the way of rebuilding the temple. Somebody asked about the Samaritans. We'll get to that when we read Ezra, because that's the beginning of the Samaritans as a separate group. Huh? Uh, so things ground to a halt. No sooner did the first exiles return around 534 that they began the temple but got nowhere with it. And it was another 20, almost 20 years before the temple was picked up again. Okay? A second wave of exiles returned uh, about the year 525. And this is the group that rallies the first group, and they begin 
to deal with building the temple. And that's where the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, are part of the story here. All right? Um, there was one fleeting thing that went through my mind. It must have been a lie. So anyway, so, so it was about 15 years between Cyrus's, oh, I can't make me up, Cyrus's proclamation and the beginning of the temple. So they spent 15 years growing crops, building homes, taking care of themselves. And that's why Haggai says, it's time, it's time. You've been building your own houses. Now it's time to build the Lord's house. Again, they had initiated it when they first got, but didn't get off the ground. But here's your last tidbit for lunch. Cyrus, that's how we say it in English. But in Hebrew, there's no soft C. It's a K sound. Same with Latin. Caesar is Kaiser in Latin. Huh? And in Hebrew, it's not Cyrus, it's Kairos. And the S is not S, it's Sh. It's Koresh. Does that name ring a bell? Okay, David Koresh of the, of the Branch Davidians in Waco. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. They read this stuff, and they say it's about themselves. D d remember, it was Cyrus was the messianic figure. I take your hand. You're going to be the Messiah. That's where that name David, that wasn't his name either, David from King David, Koresh from Cyrus. <laughs> Let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son.